Okay, welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of antigen recognition by focusing now on uh, the recognition of antigen by T cell receptors. So uh, there are many similarities between B cell receptors, antibodies, and T cell receptors. Uh, but T cells uh, have some unique uh, signaling uh, mechanisms that they that they use when they bind to their antigen and initiate downstream signals. So we'll dig into those in a lot of detail in this lecture. We'll start by looking at the structure of a T cell receptor, our TCR. Um, as you can see here, uh, the T cell receptor looks a lot like a, an immunoglobulin molecule. There, there are a lot of overlapping structural features. As you can see in this image, you can sort of think of the T cell receptor as uh, analogous to the FAB domain of an immunoglobulin molecule. Um, so um, as in the FAB domain, we have a, a light and a heavy chain, and we have a variable and a constant domain within those uh, both of those chains. The T cell receptor looks pretty similar, and if we zoom in, we can see it here. The T cell receptor has an alpha chain and a beta chain, and uh, both the alpha and the beta chains have a variable region and a constant region. So pretty similar to the FAB fragment of a, um, uh, of a immunoglobulin molecule. Um, the variable region is the part that binds to the antigen. As you can imagine, it needs to vary quite a bit so that it can recognize all the different types of antigens that there are. Whereas the, um, the domains that are closer to the plasma membrane are the constant regions. Uh, they don't display as much variability. Uh, they look pretty similar across all T cell receptors. The T cell receptor um, goes, uh, is anchored in the membrane. It is a receptor. And it has these short cytoplasmic tails which uh, interact with cytoplasmic proteins which actually allow it to transduce a signal. So similar to cytokine receptors, T cell receptors by themselves um, are not able to transmit signals. They need to recruit a bunch of different molecules inside the cell in, act in order to actually accomplish a bio their biological function. Uh, so we'll be introduced to all of those molecules in just a minute. Um, but here, uh, again, I just want to sort of st stress that uh, the structure of the T cell receptor looks like the FAB domain, the FAB uh, fragment of an immunoglobulin molecule, alpha and beta chains, which both have variable and constant uh, regions. So, uh, um, yeah, and this text here explains that nicely. So, um, what does the T cell receptor um, need in order to accomplish its signaling? Of course, it needs to bind to antigen, but remember that T cell receptors uh, require the activity of a co-receptor in order to signal. So, we've been introduced to these co-receptors before. They are our old friends by now, CD8 and CD4. And so, remember that cytotoxic T cells express the co-receptor CD8, whereas T helper cells express the co-receptor CD4. And so these co-receptors are really required for the T cell receptor to be able to uh, perceive antigens that are, that are being presented to it. And remember that uh, cytotoxic T cells, which express CD8, recognize antigen being presented by MHC class 1, uh, whereas CD4 facilitates the recognition of antigen being presented by MHC class 2. So there are kind of three pieces for antigen recognition uh, with T cells. Uh, there's the T cell receptor the co-receptor, and the MHC molecule. All three are really needed uh, to transmit a signal downstream of antigen binding uh, by T cells. So we're going to look at each of the pieces in a little bit more detail now. Um, we're going to start by looking at the structure of MHC. So MHCs are pretty similar also to immunoglobulin molecules. They have a lot of similarities. Uh, we're going to start here by looking at the structure of MHC class 1. Um, MHC class 1 has a alpha chain, which is made up of three subunits. And you can kind of see it's folded over here. So there's alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. But MHC class 1 also binds to another protein subunit, which is actually encoded by a different gene uh, called beta 2 microglobulin. So when the alpha chain of MHC class 1 binds with beta 2 microglobulin, we get the whole MHC class 1 molecule. So, um, you know, you can kind of see here there's there's some similarities to the to the again to the FAB domain of or the FAB you know portion of an antibody or a T cell receptor. Uh, we have kind of two subunits up here which actually bind to the antigen, uh, alpha one and alpha two, uh, and they form this cleft. What we call a cleft is basically like a little trough or a little uh, indentation where the the antigenic peptide uh, lays and, and is, associates and can be presented by the MHC molecule. Uh, so the, the antigen interacts with uh, A1 and A2, or alpha-1 and alpha-2, 
whereas the alpha-3 domain and the beta-2 microglobulin domain, they are structurally analogous to the, to the constant regions of an immunoglobulin molecule. So uh, alpha-3 and beta-2 microglobulin are, are sort of the constant regions of the MHC class 1 molecule. So again, very similar themes that we've seen here before, uh, just slightly different structure. An alpha chain uh, for MHC class 1, which has three subunits, uh, bound to beta-2 microglobulin. This is a little bit different than MHC class 2. Uh, MHC class 2 does not have beta-2 microglobulin. Instead, it has uh, two of its own chains. So uh, there's an alpha chain and a beta chain. Um, alpha-1 and beta-1 uh, make up the peptide binding cleft of MHC class 2, uh, whereas alpha-2 and beta-2 are what are analogous to the constant regions uh, on an immunoglobulin molecule. So you can see here that uh, you know this, these structural themes happen over and over again in all of the molecules we're discussing in this lecture. Um, but for MHC class 2, uh, you want to remember that it's alpha-1 and beta-1 that form the peptide binding cleft and actually uh, hold the antigen so that it can be presented, where, whereas alpha-2 and beta-2 are more like constant domains. Okay, so those are the MHC molecules, uh, just kind of a, a very broad overview of their structure. Let's look at the co-receptors uh, that facilitate the binding of, of the T-cell receptor to these MHC class, uh, either of these MHC molecules. So CD4 and CD8, they look pretty different. They have different structures, um, but they're not very complicated. Um, so CD4, as you can see on the left, uh, forms this kind of rod-shaped structure, uh, which has four domains, D1, D2, D3, and D4. Uh, and this forms like kind of a really a rigid kind of stick that sticks out of the surface of the cell. Um, whereas CD8 has two chains, a, a very simple alpha and beta chain. Um, and so uh, the structure of these molecules is not uh, you know, uh, really um, all that remarkable, but except that they look different from each other. And because of that, they're going to interact with the MHC molecule in slightly different ways. Um, so if we take the CD4 and the CD8 molecule and we kind of put them in context with the MHC molecules, you can see here that um, CD4 is going to associate with MHC class 2. And this is very important that uh, this interaction between the co-receptor and MHC uh, is really necessary in order to actually bind the antigen uh, on the TCR. Um, but uh, the, the CD4 molecule binds to the MHC class 2 molecule um, at the D1 domain. The D1 domain kind of uh, binds to the beta chain of MHC class 2, kind of in between the two subunits. Um, but uh, for the purposes of this, we can say that D1 uh, associates with the beta chain of MHC class 2, whereas in the CD8 molecule, the alpha chain of CD8 is going to associate with the alpha 3 subunit of MHC class 1, whereas the beta chain of CD8 is going to associate with the alpha 2 subunit of MHC class 1. So basically, CD8 associates uh, with you know, the, this kind of half of the MHC class 1 molecule made up of alpha 2 and alpha 3. Whereas for CD4, its D1 subunit associates with the beta chain of MHC class 2. Uh, in either case, uh, this facilitates uh, several of the important signaling steps, which we'll get into in just a minute. Um, but uh, the co-receptor interacting with the MHC molecule is really important. Um, and it is going to uh, ultimately enable the activation of the T-cell receptor complex itself. So now that we've talked about these two parts of the, of the sort of tripartite group of things that, that need to come together, let's talk about the T-cell receptor a little bit more. So we introduced ourselves to the, the structure of the T-cell receptor itself, which we see here it has alpha and beta chain, uh, has the antigen binding domain. But the T-cell receptor has some additional parts to it, or some additional partners that it needs in order to transmit a signal. Um, and so let's, let's look at those. So the T-cell receptor itself, or the T-cell proper, is really only the alpha and beta chain, the part that recognizes the antigen. But often when we're talking about the T-cell receptor, uh, we can use that as a more broad term to include some accessory proteins, basically, uh, that it needs in order to signal. Those include a molecule called CD3, and so there are uh, four different uh, chains of CD3 associated with the overall uh, T-cell receptor complex. And there's an additional thing uh, which associates with the cytoplasmic tails of the T-cell receptor called the zeta chain. So zeta is the Greek symbol for the letter Z, and it's what, you know, this kind of squiggly thing here. Um, so what's important here is that CD3 and the zeta chain have do, uh, these motifs called ITAMs. ITAM stands for immunoreceptor tyrosine-based activation motifs. So what on earth are these? Um, 
you can sort of think of ITAMs as being analogous to adapter proteins for cytokine receptors. Now, they're not adapter proteins, but they serve a similar function. The ITAMs um, can be phosphorylated. And when the ITAMs are phosphorylated, that allows them to recruit other signaling molecules to the T-cell receptor in order to transmit a signal. Um, so uh, these ITAMs on the CD3 and zeta chains are what allow the T-cell receptor to interact with other cytoplasmic signaling components. And so for that reason, they're very important. Now, I'll say that uh, the discussion of, of this part of the T-cell receptor is actually included in chapter seven. So uh, we're skipping a little bit ahead because we're not gonna cover this whole chapter in the course. So uh, we're gonna sort of hit the highlights of it in this lecture. So if you wanna learn more about some of the signaling that we're talking about, you can look at chapter seven in the textbook. Um, Otherwise, we're mostly dealing with chapter four in this in this module. Um, so, okay, so we have now um, our T cell receptor. We've talked about its uh, additional proteins that it uses, CD3 and the zeta chain, uh, which um, have these ITAMs. Uh, what do the ITAMs do? I said they recruit um, other signaling molecules. Uh, one of the most important ones that they recruit is a molecule called ZAP70. So ZAP70 is a kinase, which normally is not active. It, it exists in T cells, and T cells need it in order to signal. Um, and in its in, inactive state, you can kind of see uh, it here. It's kind of folded over here. It has a kinase domain, but it's not active um, under normal conditions. So it's constitutively inactivated. It's auto-inhibited, as you see here. Um, however, the ZAP70 molecule has two regions called SH2 domains. These SH2 domains allow the ZAP70 molecule to interact with phosphorylated ITAMs on the T-cell receptor. Um, so when the T-cell receptor binds to its antigen, its ITAMs are going to become phosphorylated, which is represented by these little circles here. Um, these phosphorylated ITAMs can then recruit ZAP70 by its SH2 domains. So SH2 domains bind to phosphorylated ITAMs. Uh, when this binding happens, this facilitates the phosphorylation of the ZAP70 molecule and the activation of its kinase activity. And so the activated uh, ZAP70 is then able to go and, down and phosphorylate other downstream targets, which are important for initiating T cell effector functions. So um, let's bring now the MHC molecule and the co-receptor back into the equation and talk about all of these parts together. Okay, so um, here on the left, you can see um, the we have the entire complex with all of our, our all of our players here. We have MHC class two. This looks the same for MHC class one, but we're just using this as an example. We have MHC class two, which has the antigen bound. Uh, we have the TCR, which is perceiving the antigen, which is being presented by MHC class two. We see the co-receptor here, which is really important. So we need all three of these things working together in order to to, in, to initiate the signaling. But what's going on inside the cell? So what we see is that when all of these things come together, um, CD4 um, or CD8, but in this case CD4, has a kinase associated with it called LIC or LCK. LIC is the molecule that actually phosphorylates the ITAMs um, on the T-cell receptor. So when all of these signaling components come together, LIC is recruited to the complex and is able to phosphorylate the ITAMs. Now that the ITAMs are phosphorylated, they are able to recruit ZAP70. Remember, the ZAP70 has the SH2 domains, which uh, allow it to associate with the ITAMs. Uh, when ZAP70 becomes bound to the ITAMs, now it can be phosphorylated by LIC. Um, and the ZAP70, once it's phosphorylated by LIC, becomes activated, and it can then go on to phosphorylate its downstream targets. Okay, so uh, we have uh, a lot of molecules here. Um, I would just sort of listen to this a few times if you're having trouble keeping up. Uh, but uh, again, the big picture is uh, MHC class two presents the antigen to the TCR. Uh, the co-receptor co CD4 facilitates this interaction, and it also brings in the, the kinase LIC into the equation. Recruitment of LIC by CD4 phosphorylates the ITAMs um, uh, associated with, this, with the T-cell receptor. Once the ITAMs are phosphorylated, they can recruit the kinase ZAP70, uh, and this happens by SH2 domain interactions. Once ZAP70 is recruited, it's phosphorylated by LIC, and now it's activated, and ZAP70 now can phosphorylate other things downstream. So uh, we're not going to talk about all the things that ZAP70 phosphorylates because there are quite a few of them, uh, but they are summarized in this figure. And so what I want to say in this figure is the, the 
the actual molecules that ZAP70 phosphorylates are not important. What I want you to recognize here and what I want you to remember um, are the different cellular and molecular mechanisms that ZAP70 engages, which actually underlie the T-cell effector functions. So um, ZAP70, when it's activated by all the signaling that we just covered, has a number of downstream targets which facilitate the following functions. One is an increase in cellular metabolic activity. Uh, so when a T cell uh, is activated, it needs to do all sorts of things. It needs to make new molecules like cytokines. It needs to move around the body. Um, it might need to proliferate and undergo clonal expansion. All of those things require energy. They need ATP. So uh, activation of the T cell receptor is going to increase its metabolic activity downstream of ZAP70 activation. The other thing it's going to do is turn on transcription factors. If you need to produce new cytokines uh, or other uh, effector molecules, uh, they need to be transcribed. So uh, ZAP70 also leads to transcription factor activation. Uh, the cell needs to move around, and sometimes it might need to even grow a little bit bigger. Activated T cells tend to be a little bit bigger than naive T cells, uh, but of course they need to move around the body. And so for cells to move, uh, that's going to require reorganization of the cytoskeleton. So actin polymerization and cytoskeletal reorganization um, are another major feature of T cell receptor activation that happens downstream of ZAP70. Finally, ZAP70 is going to um, lead to uh, increased expression and uh, activity of molecules called integrins. We haven't talked about integrins yet, but the main idea here is that integrins um, allow T cells to stick to things and also to kind of move around uh, to cluster in places. Um, but basically, integrins, facil integrins facilitate uh, the attachment of T cells to tissue surfaces in the body and also their invasion of barrier surfaces. So, you know, if the T cell needs to leave the bloodstream or it needs to enter a tissue uh, that's normally protected by a barrier, integrins and, 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 mo and associated molecules facilitate T cells, you know, migrating to where they need to go. So the combination of cytoskeletal reorganization and, uh, and integrin activity um, is really important for allowing T cells to actually find uh, the infection or whatever they're responding to in the body and, and, and address it. Okay, so these four uh, what we call signaling modules, basically, of increased metabolic activity, transcription factor activation, cytoskeletal reorganization, as well as integrin activity, um, uh, together sort of uh, facilitate all the different effector functions that T cells uh, do, whether they're cytotoxic T cells or T helper cells. Um, all four of these things are necessary in order for T cells to uh, mount their, their effector functions in response to the recognition of antigen. Okay, let's summarize. Uh, T cell receptors are immunoglobulin-like molecules that recognize antigens. They are made up of alpha and beta chains, as we saw, um, and they are also, also associated with molecules called CD3 and a zeta chain, uh, and uh, that makes up the overall T cell receptor complex. Um, TCRs require co-receptors to be fully activated. Remember that T, uh, TCs, or cytotoxic T cells, require CD8 to engage with MHC class 1, while as T helper cells require CD4 to engage with MHC class 2. Antigen recognition initiates really, uh, you know, uh, a complicated signaling cascade. We kind of just hit the highlights, um, but the big points that I stressed were that um, uh, the activation of the TCR ultimately allows a recruitment of LIC through the co-receptor, either CD4 or CD8. LIC is going to phosphorylate ITAMs on CD3 and the zeta chain. Um, and these phosphorylated ITAMs then recruit ZAP70, which allow it to be phosphorylated by LIC as well. And this um, phosphorylated ZAP70 is, is really central to mounting the T-cell effector function. So uh, ZAP70 activation is going to result in cytoskeletal reorganization and integrin expression, as well as metabolic upregulation and transcript transcription factor activation. All four of these outcomes um, are important for expressing cytokines, inducing cytotoxic effect, migrating around the body, uh, pr proliferating, all the things that an activated T cell needs to do in order to accomplish its functions. Okay, so this is antigen recognition by T cells. In the final two lectures in this module, um, we're going to kind of zoom out to the big picture a little bit and talk about uh, applications of antigen recognition, both uh, clinically and in the research enterprise, where the real, where the very uh, intense focus on what we can do with antibodies. So stay tuned for that.